even if I live forever, I will never cease to be amazed at how quickly a person's fortunes can change. A week ago, I was happy as a clam. My two children are in college and doing well. My wife Donna has taught third grade at a local school since she graduated from college 22 years ago. She's blonde, smart, sexy, funny, beautiful. You get the idea. We got married the summer after Donna graduated from college. I never regretted my marriage, not for a minute. I really don't know why she chose me. She could have had any man she wanted, but I'm not complaining. Donna is a wonderful mother and is largely responsible for how good our children have turned out to be. I work for the Art and Paul Soda Company. Don't be upset if you've never heard of it. This is a family-owned company founded by two brothers in a garage in Strasburg, Pennsylvania in 1963. No one seems to know exactly where or how they developed their formula, but there is no better carbonated soft drink on the planet. Demand for their products continued to grow. Today, they have 450 employees and resist any further expansion. The family feels they will lose control over the quality of their product if they go big. A few weeks ago, Time magazine published an article about the family and the soda they make. I now suspect that this story was the catalyst for all my recent problems. The magazine made a big deal about how closely the original family formula was guarded. Towards the end of the story, my name was mentioned as the person in charge of the company's security. I've worked for Art and Paul since I got out of the Army in 1985. I rose through the ranks and was appointed head of security three years ago. The name sounds good, but the truth is that security was never a big issue, at least not until that damn magazine story. It was presented in such a way that the secret formula was worth millions. Looking at it now, I think that's probably true. Once the story hit the newsstands, interest in our product and how it was made increased significantly. Suddenly my job wasn't so easy anymore. It became obvious that we needed to strengthen measures to protect the formula. To that end, I found myself in Las Vegas last week at an exhibition dedicated to everything a company might need to protect itself from corporate espionage. I felt a little like James Bond. I actually picked up some very useful ideas and even ordered some hardware and software for the company. The last day of the show was Saturday. By Saturday evening, I was mentally exhausted from trying to absorb so much information. I was sitting in the hotel bar, sipping beer and relaxing. I didn't expect anything and just relaxed. Then I heard someone sit down next to me, and I casually turned my head to look in that direction. I almost fell out of my chair. Standing next to me was a beautiful red-haired girl in a short dress with a low top. Her breasts formed an incredible valley that a man could stare at all night. Well, that's exactly what I did. Are you going to spend the whole night filming Gemini? Or are you going to buy the girl a drink? She asked me, flashing a beautiful smile. I managed to pull my tongue into my mouth and call the bartender. I bought her a drink and ordered myself another beer. It was on Saturday. Just three days later, I found myself fighting for my career. I arrived home on Sunday afternoon and returned to work on Monday morning. Tuesday morning found me in my office, trying to prepare a report to the board of directors for the afternoon meeting. I noticed an email appearing on my monitor. The sender had the username best friend, and there were attachments. This piqued my curiosity, so I opened the letter. There was a very short message consisting of two sentences. I sat and reread it at least a dozen times. It didn't make much sense, but I knew it would be very important to me. The message read, At noon, drive to Casey Park, and park next to the Black Lincoln near the playground. If you don't, these photos will be emailed to your boss, wife, kids, parents, and numerous community leaders. With great trepidation, I began to open the attached photos. My stomach immediately churned and I felt nauseous. Somehow someone managed to take a photo of me with the red head. In the first photo, we were in a bar. Anyone can take a photo in a public place. But then there were photographs that made my head spin. They were taken in my hotel room and were quite explicit. At first I was angry. How the hell could these photos be taken in a private room? This was a violation of my rights. Whoever made them broke a lot of laws. 
Then my thoughts changed direction, and all I could think about was what Donna would say if she found out about them. What's worse if her parents and our children see them? My mind began to understand the situation into which I had been thrust. I was clearly threatened. If the pictures of the naked redhead kneeling in front of me got out, my life could turn into crap. To top it all off, there were several even more incriminating photographs. I could even see a few large freckles on her chest in the photo where she was on top. I really didn't want the boss, the kids, and especially Donna to know these photos existed. Art and Paul Simon were quite religious people. Everyone who worked for them had a morals clause in their contract. Over the years, several people have been fired for behavior detrimental to the company. Someone got caught at work, someone was stolen from the company, and one guy was fired because he constantly lied about being sick when in fact he was fishing. As I thought about the situation, I decided that I needed to come up with a plan to deal with the problem. Why were the pictures taken? Why were they emailed to me? Why was I told to go to the park? How could I spin the situation well? There could only be one reason for my current situation, at least one that I could think of. This reason was the formula that I was obliged to defend. It was at the center of this storm that I was suddenly faced with. Perhaps I will be blackmailed into revealing this. One big problem was that I had no idea what this mixture was. Heck, I didn't drink soda. I drank beer. As the head of security, I had access to all parts of the facility. A guy smarter than me, but with my ability to penetrate more heavily guarded areas, could probably hack into computers or the damn file that held the secret. This must be the reason why my life is going downhill. I looked at my watch and realized I had to leave within an hour to get to the park by noon. I really didn't want to do this, but I picked up the phone, called Art Simon, and quickly set up a meeting with him and Paul. At exactly noon, I drove into the park and stopped next to a black Lincoln. There were two men sitting in the car, apparently waiting for me. The guy in the passenger seat got out and held the door, nodding to indicate that he wanted me to get into the car. I looked at both men. I've never seen either one before. That was very smart of you said the man behind the wheel. I have a laptop ready to send photos to every family member, friend, boss, and colleague you've ever had. I chose this place because I can get Wi-Fi from the hotel across the street. All I have to do is press the enter key. Let's get down to business, I snapped. What needs to be done to keep these photos secret? I like your attitude, Benson, the idiot chuckled. It is so simple. You're a security expert like a woodpecker carpenter. I hired a woman for this Saturday night, and you yourself noticed the redhead before my girlfriend arrived. It saved me a couple hundred bucks, and the red one was much better than the one I had for you. The photos turned out pretty good, don't you think? Let's just get this over with, I insisted. Do you need money? I need to know that there are no more hard drives with these files. I want money, okay? The man laughed. I want you to give my friend in the back seat your ID and the code you use to get into the most sensitive areas of your company. What? Do you think I'll give it to you? If they find out I gave it to you, I'll be fired and probably sued, and who knows what else. I can't do this, I said firmly. No problem, Benson. He grinned again. I'll just press this key and you'll find yourself in a world of shit so fast your head will spin. One minute, I squealed. When do I need the code and my ID? Right now, he growled. We won't give you a chance to ruin everything. Give it now, and we'll wait here until he returns. If all goes well, I'll give you this laptop and you'll never see us again. Your family will never know what a cheater you are, and we will all be happy. He can't just get in there, even if there's a code, I warned. They'll see him, and there are security cameras everywhere. This won't work. That's usually what happens my blackmailer agreed. But on the first Tuesday of the month, people in the office should meet with the bosses in the conference room and discuss strategy and marketing for the next month. Between one and two, the place will be empty, except for the guy watching the monitors. He's dumber than a fucking stick. My friend will be in and out before he knows what the hell is going on. I turned to look at the guy's partner in the back seat. He was smilling from ear to ear, holding an old Richard Nixon mask in his hands. I realized that the cameras would record Tricky Dicky and would be of little help. 
I pulled out my ID and handed it to the guy, telling him the code number. The guy got out of the car, crossed the street, got into the Nissan Sentra, and drove away. I sat next to my blackmailer and waited. He kept his finger lightly on the enter key the entire time. It was almost as nerve-wracking as sitting with a suicide bomber. An hour later, the car returned. The guy was grinning from ear to ear as he walked back to Lincoln. I did it, he exclaimed. These hillbillies are fucking idiots. Let's get back to the boss. You have what you want, so give me the computer, I demanded, reaching for the laptop. Oh, the bastard laughed, deliberately pressing the key. What a pity. I guess you won't need my laptop now. The damage is already done, low sir. I was wondering if I should beat the crap out of the guy when his friend opened my door and flashed a knife. He motioned for me to leave. I carefully got out of the car, closely watching the guy with the knife. He slammed the door, hurried to the Nissan, and climbed inside. Both cars quickly drove away. I debated whether I should jump in front of them, stop them, but end the nightmare I was in. I foolishly hoped that this idiot would keep his end of the agreement and not send the photos. Now I had to face the problem. By the time I returned to my office, I saw that the turbine of life was indeed spinning very fast and waste was flying everywhere, especially in my face. The internet is much faster than my old Jeep. Gloria, Art's secretary, called shortly after I entered my office. She and I got along well. She always enjoyed chatting with Donna at office parties. I could tell from her voice that she was worried about me. Dan, I ask you to be present in the meeting room. I'm afraid this may be related to photographs that were emailed to each board member some time ago, she added. I don't want to judge, but I can't believe you did this to your marriage. Donna loves you so much. I think that's my problem, Gloria. I think she loves me enough. Of course, this is much more than I deserve. I'll get up now, I told her. I had to walk past Gloria's desk to enter the boardroom. When I entered the office, she was already waiting for me. She motioned for me to sit down and pointed to a chair. They told me to ask you to wait here, Dan. They'll send for you soon, she promised. Do I know your friend? I looked at Gloria and saw a photo on the monitor. Gloria enlarged the pictures so that the red-haired woman's face and upper body filled the entire screen. The woman had red hair scattered across her face so that only her smile was visible. I had to admit, she did have a big smile. Do you spend a lot of time in Vegas, Gloria? I asked. If not, then it is unlikely that you know her. I had to sit and cool my heels for almost half an hour. Gloria seemed to like the photos. She looked at each of them several times. Then she picked up the phone and called someone. I realized it was too good for her for me to resist. She was probably calling her friends and neighbors to tell them about the wonderful porn she had received and would send to the few people in the world who had not yet seen the pictures. While I waited, my mood became darker and darker. Finally, Gloria got a call and turned to me. You can go now, Dan. I entered the room. There were seven of them. Art and Paul were there, of course. The rest, except one, were family members. Paul's wife died several years ago, and her daughter Gwen took her place on the board of directors. Art's wife, Mildred, sat to his left. The others are Art's son, Paul's son, and company CFO Bob Robinson. Dan, we invited you here today to listen to your explanations about these photographs and the blackmail that followed them, Art said. We want to hear your side of the story before we make any decisions. I looked everyone in the eye before formulating my answer. I've always heard that it's best to make these things personal, like the defendant looks at the jury. I turned to you as soon as I realized that there would be an attempt at blackmail, as you know, Art. I was able to very quickly develop a plan that should allow the company not only to keep the secret of success, but also to find out who was behind the attempted theft, I replied. That part went very well, Dan, Art agreed. We have already received a couple of reports from the company you recommended. They're following these thugs as we speak. This idiot stole my wife's recipe for a rather bitter drink that she likes to serve during the Christmas holidays. The problem is what you did that allowed you to be blackmailed. These pictures are very disturbing. You are a married man, 
and you were in Vegas representing our company. I claim that the photographs were taken illegally. They have invaded my privacy and should not be considered. What I or any of you do behind closed doors is our business and is not subject to review by our employers, friends, or acquaintances, I concluded. The problem is, we know what you did behind closed doors, Dan. It's a family company and we have pretty high standards, although they're actually quite reasonable, Paul replied. We keep our Mariek vows sacred. We cannot condone or ignore this kind of action with a lady, no matter who she is. I saw that I could not convince them that my privacy had been violated and they should ignore the photographs. I knew that if I threatened to sue, they would show me outside even faster. Their beliefs were not shaped by the courts. I thought about it and decided to leave. I'll have to discuss my options with a lawyer. I knew this would be a costly and ugly lawsuit and was hoping for a better resolution. I have nothing more to add, I concluded, and now it must be... Suddenly the door swung open and Gloria entered the room. This was extremely unusual for her, and it was clear that she was very nervous. I am so sorry. I hate interfering with the board of directors, but I will never forgive myself if I don't at least try. Mrs. Benson, to see you. Donna entered the room and walked straight towards the group. She held her head high and looked gorgeous despite wearing a long, simple coat and carrying a large bag. I apologize for interrupting you, ladies and gentlemen, but I believe I have some information that may shed light on this situation and prevent you from making a terrible mistake, she announced. Mrs. Benson, Donna, Art answered kindly. It is clear that you will be upset, but this meeting room is not a forum for internal struggle. We are sorry this happened, but we must take action. Your anger at Dan is not what we want to see here. Anger at Dan. Donna laughed. I love him more than ever. You all know what a wonderful worker, father, and husband he was. Now that you've seen the pictures, you also know what a great lover he is. I hurried to Donna and, taking her hand, dragged her out of the room. She didn't give in and pulled her hand away. Dan, you are such a wonderful husband. This is what I have to do. I want them to know the truth and I know you won't tell it, Donna insisted. I will do it. What exactly is the truth Dan is hiding from us, Donna? Asked a very confused Art Simon. The truth is this. The woman in the photographs is me. I had a seminar in Los Angeles the same week Dan was in Vegas. I surprised him by arranging my flight home so I could spend one night in Vegas. It turned out to be one of the best dates I've ever been on, if you know what I mean. Donna laughed, pointing at the photos in front of the group. In fact, I see some evidence lying on your conference table. Wow. Did you buy any oceanfront property while you were in Las Vegas, Mrs. Benson? Asked Bob Robinson. If we believe your story, we'll probably believe anything, right? If you really are the woman in these photos, why didn't Dan just tell us ahead of time and skip all this trouble? It's easy, Mr. Robinson, Donna replied. Dan is a real gentleman. He would rather be fired than embarrass or humiliate me. There is nothing he wouldn't do to spare his family pain. Gloria called me and told me about the photographs and her suspicions that I was the woman in the photographs. I immediately opened my email and realized they were taken in our hotel room without our knowledge or permission. Dan was willing to come here and take whatever you had to offer to protect me. I think this is the kind of person this company needs. If this is true, and I personally don't believe it is, then why do you call yourself this red lady? asked Robinson. Aren't you making this up so he can maintain his position in the company? Why else would you want to embarrass yourself by making such a wild statement? It's simple again, Mr. Robinson, Donna objected hotly. I'm ashamed that someone could be so vile as to take pictures of my husband and I while making love. The truth, however, is that my love for my husband far exceeds any personal embarrassment I may experience. I will not stand by and allow him to be slandered or insulted. He is a wonderful person with an impeccable reputation and should never tolerate this. How old are you, dear? asked Mrs. Mildred Simon. Donna turned her attention to Art Simon's wife. She looked at the older woman for half a minute before answering. Since I'm revealing everything here, I might as well tell you, Mrs. Simon. I am 44 years old. 
I weigh 122 pounds and am an inch shy of five and a half feet tall. With all due respect to the ladies present, the woman in these photographs is much younger than 44 years old, Robinson snorted. I'm willing to bet that, Wars, there's not even 35 in these photos. I grabbed Robinson by the lapels of his jacket and threw him across the table before he could finish his sentence. I moved back to give him a good hook when Donna grabbed my arm. Dan, do not even think about it. He simply states what he considers to be a fact. Let him go now, Donna barked. I loosened my grip on Robinson and let him plop back into his seat. It seemed quite obvious that my work was now history. Mr. Robinson, I don't know how you feel about your wife being insulted in your presence, but believe me, Dan will not tolerate it from you or anyone else. He just worships me. Donna beamed, looking at me. My dear, Mildred Simon intervened. Personally, I admire the way you both defend each other, but I am afraid that Mr. Robinson made a fair point, although his rudeness is very upsetting. You are 44 years old, and the woman in the photographs looks much younger. Her face is not visible in any of them because her hair always falls on her face. Donna took a red wig from her bag and placed it on her head over her blonde hair. The group at the table looked unconvinced. You seem to have a red wig, Mrs. Benson, but the age difference is still a serious obstacle for us, Mildred Simon said. For example, it's hard for me to accept that you are the woman in the photographs. It is quite possible that you will go to great lengths to save your husband's position in our company. You have no idea how far I would go for Dan, Mrs. Simon, Donna replied. Do you accept that if the woman in the photographs is me, then Dan did nothing wrong? that he essentially helped your company prevent the theft of your formula to great personal embarrassment and ridicule? Would you agree that a married couple can enjoy love in private, as depicted in these photographs, without shame or humiliation? Is it possible that if we had pictures of you and Mr. Simon in the heat of passion, there wouldn't be much you weren't doing here? It's not about Mr. Simon and me, Mrs. Benson, Mildred Simon smiled. I will say that I would be very uncomfortable if photographs of my personal life were distributed on the Internet, although less so if I could look as good as the young lady in these photographs. We seem to have reached a dead end here, I'm afraid. I won't accept this. Dan is accused of inappropriate behavior. In fact, he is condemned for loving his wife. The so-called proof that he cheated on me is a bunch of photos. They don't even show my face because of the cheap wig I bought at LAX. You can't even see my face in the photo taken at the bar when I was still dressed, Donna said calmly. For some reason, I knew it would come to this. I want you to look at these photos that Gloria has enlarged, Donna insisted, taking two glossy photographs from her purse and throwing them on the table in front of the group. Look at the freckles on the left breast. Also check out the little tattoo below that my husband is so excited about. Then compare them to this. I thought I had seen everything. Now everyone has seen everything. As she spoke, Donna quickly unbuttoned her coat and threw it off her shoulders. She was completely naked. I didn't know whether I should reach under the table, grab her coat and throw it back on her, or just stand there and beam. There is something very erotic about seeing your wife naked in front of other people. I've seen her naked for 22 years, but she's never looked sexier. Mr. Simon, please look at the photographs then at my left breast, and then down. What conclusion have you come to, sir? Donna asked Paul Simon, walking up to the table and standing right in front of him. I have come to the conclusion, Mrs. Benson, Paul Simon replied after what seemed like an unnecessarily long examination, that you are indeed the woman in the photograph and the epitome of beauty. I also think we owe you and the extremely lucky Mr. Benson standing next to you a huge apology. In retrospect, during this process you were both subjected to unfair accusations bordering on slander. I now propose that the board of directors formally apologize to Dan Benson, acknowledge that his quick thinking saved our company from losing our formula, and give him a bonus of $5,000 as well as a 5% increase in his salary, he continued. Any other suggestions? Six other members seemed to respond simultaneously, supporting Paul's proposal. It passed unanimously. Donna was still hugging me when Art Simon carefully draped the coat over her shoulders. 
His wife Mildred was waiting for us to separate. My dear, it goes against the laws of nature for a woman to look as good as you at 44 or almost any age. I apologize for my reluctance to believe, but I assure you, if I had not seen it with my own eyes, I would never have believed that a teacher could achieve such a metamorphosis by putting on a wig and taking off her clothes. Your devotion to your husband, his respect and love for you is very touching. It's unfortunate that these photos of you are circulating, especially when you look so good, but your face is unrecognizable in them. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.